uh, questions in the uh, chat room there we will direct the question here yeah thank you thank you very much samir sir you can go ahead thank you sir hi so uh, yes good of good evening to everyone and uh, it's a lovely uh, series that we are having uh, in this on this weekend and uh, i know that uh, there's a lot of stormy weather going on down south uh, where most of you must be right now so uh, hopefully everybody is safe and inside and spending time doing something useful <laughs> so i am very happy to present here and thank you surender for uh, organizing uh, this so <clears throat> basically uh, from uh, my understanding uh, the talk was organized for something called the space generation uh, uh, council and uh, that is mainly to encourage and uh, basically turn the students of this generation towards this exciting field of space and uh, space will be a very big field in the coming uh, gen uh, you know let's say a few decades in fact while a lot of uh, ground breaking work is being done right now by many pioneers and uh, these pioneers uh some of them are entrepreneurs they are businessmen let's say <laughs> in simple words but there are also a lot of scientists who have uh, given their life towards a vision towards a dream in which humanity humanity can go to space and uh also make use of space so it's not just about you know going on a trip and coming back leaving our junk behind <laughs> it's also using space properly using uh, our earth properly because of our understanding of space and its uh, uh, well, let's say its advantages and disadvantages so therefore uh, this field is is going to be really important and uh, thank you uh, surender for and the team for organizing these uh, talks so um, i work for an astronomy and astrophysics institute and i hope you can see my slides right now uh, so uh, this uh, this institute uh, is a uh, well known uh, international institute but our job is mainly to support the study of astronomy and astrophysics in india especially in the universities and colleges so it's an all india institute it uh, doesn't have branches <laughs> as such but uh we have a large outreach program very very uh, uh good outreach program and i kind of held that um, section so uh, therefore my interest is in astronomy and astrophysics uh, and when i was asked to give this talk about space science and technology i thought how how does astronomy and astrophysics relate with uh, space science and technology well astronomy is the way in which we came to know that there is space there is something outside this world there is this enormous universe in which our earth is less than a tiny speck of dust right and uh, if we didn't have astronomy if we didn't have observations of space <clears throat> we would never have uh, been able to look at the world in this view and let alone think of going uh, outside uh, our earth's influence and create technology for doing that uh, uh, and making that happen so uh, space science space technology is basically coming from the knowledge that there is something called space and uh, we can go there okay and knowing uh, about uh, the laws of physics uh, which a lot of which have actually come from the study of astronomy and and now what is called astrophysics at some point of time physics Who, you know the contribution to physics was coming from astronomy so <laughs> it's a nice uh, circle i'm however sad to see that astronomy is very little uh, of astronomy is studied in uh, school syllabus and by the time you do go to uh, college and university it is just gone somewhere you just uh, care about um, medicine and engineering which can fetch you a lot of money of course you should go for that but then uh, there's also a connection of engineering medicine uh, or other fields of science and technology to space science and that is what is uh, heartening here that uh, so with, with the popularity of nasa and isro and space science uh, and many of the students would ask me uh, how do i become an aeronautics engineer 
because they heard some astronauts were in aeronautic engineers. I'll come to that uh, later, later. So all of these popular fields have kind of brought back the focus to astronomy and astrophysics as well. And now we have a lot of popular information online uh, about astronomy and astrophysics. So I want to show and share with you some of the very, very brief uh, steps which led to uh, us being able to do something called space-based astronomy. And uh, of course, this is not a comprehensive course on space-based astronomy or a historical uh, tale of it. So I will just go through uh, very, very, um, you know, uh, introductory level uh, uh, things about astronomy, what is astronomy, what are telescopes, and wh what do they do in space? So um, yes, we can call them new eyes in the sky. Now, uh, forever, mankind has been uh, using their own eyes to look at space, right? And as you can see in this beautiful picture, one of my favorite pictures. Uh, so uh, you, you can see that uh, just with your eyes, you can see a lot of things here, okay? And those who are uh, paying attention or you know, you're able to see this properly, you can make it full screen. I think that, that would uh, kind of <laughs> help you see better. So in this, in this slide, if you notice, you see a lot of different kinds of objects in the sky, in the night sky. And that's what uh, astronomers study, the night sky. So uh, in this lovely picture, you can see the Milky Way there. And in fact, uh, there, there are uh, a few objects, very enigmatic objects like this uh, patch here and this patch here. So these may seem like clouds in the sky. Uh, this hazy cloud is the Milky Way. It is a part of our galaxy that we are seeing in the sky. And <clears throat> this part here and this patch here are actually other galaxies. So these are the two uh, other galaxies which are really close by to us called the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. They looked like clouds to people who named them. So these are individual galaxies, the smaller galaxies compared to our Milky Way, but they're there in the sky and you can see them. And then there's this lovely patch of an auroral lighting, okay, uh, that is uh, giving us some uh, connection with space weather. So it's not just uh, something which happens in our atmosphere, but it happens there because of uh, a lot of solar radiation and uh, solar wind coming into our atmosphere and hitting us. Okay, it's something we would never have known without astronomy. Um, <clears throat> there are many other things, of course, there are stars. Many of these, uh, sorry, all of these are part of our own galaxies because we cannot see stars in other galaxies individually. Okay, so uh, you can see that this is what our eyes can show. It, of course, not, not as dramatic maybe because this is a picture, this is a photograph uh, taken with uh, skills of astrophotography, which require you to actually keep your shutter open for the camera. You have to uh, expose the sensor uh, to light coming in for a longish time, okay, to ca capture the uh, la a large amount of the faint light coming from various objects. So things like Milky Way and these galaxies, they give out very little light and our eyes being really tiny, like, you know, I, I would say they're about uh, less than an inch in size and uh, less than a millimeter, sorry, less than a centimeter in diameter, the, the iris of it, which can collect the light. It's very small, okay? And so this is not enough, it's not adequate to, uh, you know, show us this magnificent view. So there are techniques which astronomers have developed over time to make the best use of uh, sensors and cameras to collect the most amount of light. Okay, a light is the crux of astronomy. Everything depends on there being light. Okay, so this is a lovely picture, an astrophotograph of the sky. And most of these um, <laughs> light sources in this picture are natural. But you see, sometimes we uh, think a flaw can make something more beautiful. So for me, this picture is made a little more beautiful, a little more uh, you know, complicated by this tiny streak here. Can you see this, this line here, the straight line? Right? And in nature, getting things perfect is very rare. Okay. And so when you see things perfectly, 
uh, aligned or perfectly uh, rounded or perfectly triangular or something like that. There are, there are some forces acting on it, right? And uh, otherwise, you'll see this galaxy is irregular, this galaxy is irregular, our galaxy is irregular, this cloud is irregular. This is not exactly straight lines, right, in the mountains also. So, so when there is something, uh, you know, really perfect, it means there is something, some reason behind it. And this line is, in fact, not a man-made, not a natural line. This is because of a man-made satellite passing by in the sky. And at that point of time, when photograph was being taken, light from the sun was reflecting off the sun uh, of the satellite towards the camera, towards your eyes, if, if you were there. And since the camera's uh, shutter was open for a little while, and the satellite was moving, this was not a stationary satellite, it was moving in the sky. So while it was moving, it was reflecting light all the time. And so all its positions have been recorded. And of course, it was moving in an orbit, so therefore a straight line. So this is a combination of space technology seen uh, while, when, while somebody was trying to photograph an astronomical lovely site. <clears throat> yeah. So what I was pointing out to you was that uh, light is the crux, and we can collect light and use it for information in various smart ways. That's what astronomers do. Okay. So light, light can be of various types. So it can originate from various places. You just celebrated Diwali, I hope, <laughs> and lit a lot of uh, colorful uh, lamps and candles. That's a man-made source of light. It, it comes, the light comes from a lot of heat, which is coming from the burning of wax, okay? And some part of that uh, energy is given out in the form of uh, this radiation that we call visible light. Okay. In this case, it's very yellowish. Of course, we also see the sun giving us light every day and without it, we would not exist here. Right? That's a, another different source of light. And the reason, the cause for the light coming from it is, is very different from what causes a candle to be uh, luminescent. Okay. Now, that's, that's one way of, uh, another way of producing light, nuclear fusion in the center of the sun. There's also nuclear fission, which can produce a lot of uh, different kinds of light, uh, which uh, in, on the earth has been harmful. So let's not get into that. But there are different ways of producing light. There are other objects which produce light, like galaxies, as I said. Galaxies are a huge collection of lit up things, like stars, for example. Of course, most of the light that comes from space comes from stars. And I'm talking about the light that we can see, visible light. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, you can see that there are also different kinds of sources of light. And now as we <laughs> progress, uh, we went from candles to incandescent bulbs to, uh, you know, CFLs to LED bulbs nowadays. And we are growing more and more efficient in the use of energy. And maybe you'll realize that some of these, uh, this advancement is also due to space technology. Okay. Some of these things, semiconductor technology, uh, <clears throat> coating technology, etc., actually came because of its use in space. So, uh, okay, <laughs> not get into too many references to confuse you, but what this slide basically implies is that there are various sources of light. Some are man-made and some are natural. Okay, and astronomers basically study almost everything which is. Uh, out there in space and emits light. However, all these lights, light things that you see here are things which your eyes can see. Okay? And uh, uh, from, from study of this light um, in, in its visible form, in the form that your eyes can see, uh, over, the year, over the years, scientists have developed an understanding of what is the nature of light. So what is light? Okay? And uh, people will talk, talk to you, they will call it photons, they will call it uh, light waves. And so, yes, there are way, different ways of looking at light and we're still trying to understand light completely. So uh, this is not the aim of this lecture, but in general, when the astronomer kind of uh, tries to look at light, most astronomers try to look at light, they consider it like a wave and then talk about optics 
which is a way of collecting these waves and making sense of them. Right? So optics is the way of, of, of changing the direction of light or focusing light or collecting it uh, in, the, in a way that it can give you an image. Okay, so there the wave nature of light is very important. And in fact, if you look at the wave nature of light, it is um, not just a <laughs> normal wave like, like you saw here. Yes, of course, when you, when you talk about a wave, a wave has something called a wavelength, so it is periodic, right? So it's it's got a period. So from here to here, you'll see after some period, it comes back. And if I could extend this wave later, it would come back here. Right at the same distance. So there's something called a wavelength. After that same wavelength, it will come to the same phase. It also has intensity. So how you know how much strength and energy is being uh, strength is there in the wave. But light is a strange wave. It's not the same thing. It's it's not just a it's not a wave in a medium as such. But it's a wave of uh, it's 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 uh, it's not it's not in a medium. So basically, it is basically a disturbance, okay, a periodic disturbance in something called an electric or a magnetic field, okay. And uh, this was very difficult to comprehend for uh, physicists and those who were here in this uh, talk to uh, and, and who aspire to be an astrophysicist, an astronomer, or space scientist. I think this understanding of um, uh, electromagnetism, uh, in fact, what is called the electrodynamics is a very crucial part of your further studies uh, up, up in college and uh, further. Okay, so there you'll get to know that, that there are fields in the universe and which do not require a medium to exist. And light is the disturbance in that field. Okay, the disturbance is caused by a source, of course. So when a source causes a disturbance, that disturbance goes forth and it is carrying energy given by the source to it. Right. So the disturbance which goes forth has a characteristic, uh, has, is carrying a characteristic of the source. Right. So, for example, if I have to uh, just come back to <laughs> some some example, here uh, is my voice. So my voice box is causing a disturbance, and it's traveling through air to this microphone, and it's collecting it. Right. Now, if there was, uh, let's say, I don't know, Lata Mangeshkar, uh, you know, speaking uh, right here, uh, standing right beside me, she would be speaking in a different voice. So immediately uh, after you hear the output from the microphone, you would be able to make out whether it's me speaking or her speaking, because our voice boxes, each of us are creating different uh, characteristic waves, and those waves are producing a sound which is very different. Similarly, every source produces a different kind of light, right? And so those characteristics uh, in a scientific way are basically the energy and the uh, uh, frequency, okay? So <clears throat> that frequency defines the uh, properties of light. Now, I have to go faster in this. I can't uh, dwell too much on this. So I have to quickly tell you that uh, the frequency or wavelength, which is just the inverse of the frequency, are many in uh, types for something we call light. So this waves that you saw, this is electromagnetic waves. Okay, that's what light is. Now this electromagnetic waves, the wavelength here can be very different depending on the energy of the source producing it. Okay, so uh, and the wave carries out that energy from the source. So, uh, depending on what is causing, uh, what kind of energetic source is causing the light, the wavelength differs. Okay. So, uh, so let's say there's something which has very low energy. Okay. So, the wavelength caused would be really long. So, the it will be very less frequent because the energy is less. So, the light will be less frequent. The frequency will be low. So, the wavelength will be high. Wavelength will be long. Okay. So. If you actually look at the types of light which have a long wavelength, i.e. Uh, less frequency, they are called radio waves. Okay, they have very long wavelengths. About you know the longest ones could be more than football fields or a mountain size. Okay, and of course there are uh, other wavelengths which we commonly call something like AM, FM, etc. Now these are uh, of the order of meters. Then after that, there are electromagnetic waves. They don't just finish there, right? So this frequency range or, you know, 
the, the, there are different types of sources in the universe. Each of them will have their own frequency. And it's not like uh, they, they just finish at there, there is only one type of sources. There's all sorts of sources. If you consider all the humans in the world, they will probably fill up all the frequency bands uh, of sound. This is not sound, but I'm just giving an example. So similarly, there are sources in nature which can fill up the whole band of uh, frequencies right from, uh, and wavelengths. Right from, let's say, 10 to the power 5, which is 10, uh, 5 hertz, to 10 to the power 18 hertz. Okay? And if we have sources with different energies, we can get different wavelengths and frequencies of light. And they are classified like this. So radio waves, microwaves, millimeter waves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, and then very energetic X-rays and gamma rays. Okay? So visible light, as you can see, the wavelengths between 400 to 700 nanometers. Okay. This is uh, <laughs> a thousandth of a uh, micrometer. Okay. So, so 400 to 700 nanometer wavelengths uh, are what our eyes are sensitive to. So this is called visible light. And that is the tiny part of this whole range of frequencies in which light can exist and does exist. But this is the only tiny part that our eyes can see. There's a very interesting reason uh, for this, and that is because our sun, our uh, our energy giver, our energy giver of light, mostly emits in that. And there's another reason that if you look at so this electromagnetic spectrum, as it is called, this whole range of frequencies oh, from radio to uh, gamma rays, all of it can exist and the sun does produce all of it. However, there's an important factor. So in this slide, if you can see, notice this top part, it says penetrates Earth's atmosphere, question mark. And then here it says, yes. Okay, so yes for radio. Okay, and some part is gray. So where some radio and microwaves can go through the atmosphere and some will get absorbed. So it's not, perfectly transparent. The atmosphere is not perfectly transparent to all waves. Okay, So some radio waves do go through continuously and that is why radio is our favorite means of uh, uh, using light for communication. So when you sometimes say, okay, I'm not using light for communication, I'm using a radio. <laughs> no, yeah, radio is a type of light, Okay, only long wave. So it needs different kinds of receivers and uh, transporters. But anyway, so radio waves can go through uh, our um, atmosphere. Some microwaves can, some microwaves cannot. So radars work on that principle. And there is this huge patch which says no, no coming through the atmosphere. Okay, if you come through, you'll be stopped. Okay, so from a lot of microwaves and a lot of infrared is actually stopped by our atmosphere. Then some part of infrared does come through. This is the higher wavelength. So the higher, uh, sorry, this is the higher energy or the lower wavelengths, okay, of infrared. So these are these have more energy. So you know, <laughs> uh, like if if there is some uh, security person and you're trying to uh, get into some function somewhere, and if you if you run really fast, maybe you can go past the security person. Don't try that. I'm just giving a small example. So similarly, uh, these uh, infrareds which are traveling slowly with less energy, they get stopped. But if, if they just run past, some of them can get through. So some infrareds get through. And visible light, of course, of course, it gets through. And all of it gets through. So we can see all of it. So after that, if you notice, most ultraviolet X-ray and gamma rays cannot come through the atmosphere. OK, so it's a big no, completely stopped. OK, so there's this big patch of no here, big patch of no here. And there are only two patches of yes. Uh, which is a radio and visible. So if only this kind of light is available for anybody to see, then obviously our eyes will adapt to that kind of light and we will make uh, measures to see that kind of light. right? And of course, as I said, some of the infrared also come through. So uh, if ever you have gone out in the sun and you're not looking at the sun, but you're feeling hot on your skin, this is because of the infrared from the sun. Okay, so uh, you know, the colors of the rainbow, which are also part of what is called the visible light, as you can see somewhere here. Okay. None of these colors can make you hot. 
right? So if you have like red light falling on your skin or yellow or orange or green, blue, violet, indigo, you can never make your skin hot. But there are lamps which may not glow red or uh, yellow or uh, blue, but they can still make you feel hot, okay? So that is infrared. And uh, the, every time you feel some heat or use some heat of the sun to uh, evaporate, let's say, dry your clothes, etc., you're using the infrared from the sun. Okay, so that is the infrared light. Okay, our body is therefore susceptible and um, you know has adapted to sense this range. This range cannot be uh, <laughs> adapted to because the wavelength itself is bigger than humans and the buildings that we live in. So. Forget about uh, you know sensing that we we are not even close to their size. Okay, these things do not come through. However, <clears throat> we are using uh, some of them. So I'll show you uh, an example here. Uh, again, I come back to infrared. So uh, this is a picture in visible light. Okay, and you can see a person here uh, works at NASA. So uh, he has a blue shirt on, and there's a red shirt inside. There's a blackish plant, plant here, a black plastic with his hands inside, probably. If he has hands, how do you know? <laughs> and then uh, he's got a face, he's got hair, nice hair and nice uh, spectacles, right? So you can make this out and the background is kind of white or gray. So uh, this is a beautiful picture in a visible wavelength. Now, if you will just look at the infrared coming from all the parts of this picture, you will be surprised that how things change. Okay, and just look at the infrared picture here. So the background has gone black. So basically the wall is not giving out any infrared or not reflecting any infrared. This person, yes, he's lit up. Okay, and that is because our body has a lot of heat. Okay, we, we keep ourselves warm, we eat food and we produce heat. <laughs> so what you're basically producing is infrared light. Okay. So when you say I'm, I'm feeling really hot, it's basically your body is giving out a lot of infrared. And so this can be very easily seen because you can see his face is a flush and it's, it's really bright in infrared. The rest of the parts are slightly like the hair and the clothes, etc., have been warmed by the body and have themselves become emitters of infrared. But they're not so warm compared to the skin. So skin is warmer and the rest of the parts, depending on how warm they are, are giving out less and more infrared. You see, the colors have disappeared. Here, of course, there's a, just to give you a sense of uh, some color, uh, we've put in a tinge of orange to this picture. But in general, this is black and white picture. So it's grayscale. It's, it's white or black. White means yes, uh, there is infrared. Black means no. And in between the gray shades mean there is some word infrared. So the colors are gone. There's no blue, there's no uh, this thing. They're all infrared <laughs> right now. So this is how you would look like if you could see uh, infrared. But the wonderful thing is you can see this plastic has suddenly disappeared. It's become transparent. You can see his hand, you can count his fingers. Okay. Uh, this is because this plastic is actually transparent to infrared. Okay. Now you'll probably get that idea of the, uh, the atmosphere being transparent to some wavelengths and not being transparent to some. So the, the, uh, the compounds which make up this plastic, okay, their molecular gaps and the absorption uh, characteristics of those molecules are such that they can absorb all of uh, visible light, all of it. But then the gaps and the, as I said, the uh, absorption coefficients are such that uh, infrared rays can come through, okay? So infrared rays are able to come through this and therefore you can see the hot hands. Uh, and in fact, even like back there, you can see behind the plastic also, his shoulder is visible here, right? So amazing uh, realization that with infrared, you can have a very different view of the same things which were hidden earlier. There's a, there's a counter thing. Now you can see the glass, which is on his eyes, glasses, spectacles they are not <laughs> transparent to infrared. So therefore his eyes, which should have also been glowing in infrared, have suddenly turned black because this is not transparent. So this is the glasses, spectacles are more like the Earth's atmosphere, which is not transparent to infrared. However, the plastic is a different thing. It's transparent to infrared, but not to the visible. 
Now, just imagine the uses that's, that this realization can be put to. Yes, night vision. Uh, many of you must have heard of night vision goggles, uh, and uh, they're used in many various places. And but you must have seen them definitely in war movies. Okay, uh, that's one. But it has its uses. In fact, we do use something called the multi-wavelength approach for studying things. So in medicine. People uh, can combine X-rays, which are basically uh, allowing you to see the structures, the really hard structures like bones, through which X-rays cannot pass. So they show you the shadow of the bone and whether there's a crack in it or not. Okay, and infrared can actually show you muscular features. Okay, so muscular features and combining them with uh, you know bone intensity and points which seem to be more heated up because of you know more friction etc can easily be seen and then uh, therapy can be uh, done so this is just one example of how a combination of an infrared picture of the same part of the body with the x ray picture of the same part of the body if superimposed they can give you a very different look at the same area and this compared to a normal visible picture is completely different and it's you would never be able to diagnose anything with the eyes therefore there are different types of light and people are learning to use them smartly, collect them smartly and get more and more information. Okay. So that's about light. Okay. And uh, I, I, I strongly suggest that anybody who's interested in uh, astronomy, astrophysics, space sciences, etc., do uh, try and get some time to understand what is light, what is electrodynamics. Electrodynamics basically means the way in which life, light behaves, light behaves. Now we come to the next part. <clears throat> so how do you do multi-wavelength astronomy? I have just shown you that uh, the uh, slides, uh, a few slides back, that there are different types of light. I think this was this. So. You can see there are various types of light and only a small part is visible to our eye. And we have developed our cameras like in this, my, my mobile phone, etc. The, the camera basically is sensitive to the visible light. Why, why waste my uh, resources on looking at other things which I will not be able to see anyway in the picture. So this is what we have concentrated on for ages. But now I, we can see that there are these other uh, bands of light in which there might be other uh, things being seen. Okay, so uh, we kind of contribute the first thought about uh, think, uh, thinking about multivalent astronomy and uh, looking at the same objects which are in space from space. Okay, so that is a concept which was uh, which we see coming from uh, Lyman Spitzer way back in the 50s. Uh, he had written a, a paper in which he suggested that, you know, if uh, humans uh, who were already doing astronomy and doing great astronomy with really good telescopes on the earth, he, he uh, surmised that can there be a difference, can there be an improvement in astronomy if we go really high, okay, really high means beyond the atmosphere. And uh, by the time, uh, 50s, 60s, again, you have to, you have to, uh, you know, realize that we are not talking about the generation now where you just use a mobile phone which has a GPS sensor which is working with a satellite and Elon Musk is launching uh, <laughs> spacecraft uh, almost every week. This was 60s when just thinking of launching a space rocket even you know 80 kilometers high was a big deal. Yeah? We are not talking about going to Mars. So we are talking just going beyond the atmosphere. Okay. And uh, at that time, these visionaries who, who didn't even know about satellites, okay, were thinking of putting a telescope up in space and thinking about the advantages that it could give. So that's that's the level which pioneers have, okay, and that's the daring thought that these people bring to humanity, and that's why he, this person features and uh, like uh, in an earlier. Uh, <laughs> slide uh, in the previous speaker slide, uh, another person featured because these are the pioneers. And I, I always tell everybody who is interested in a field that, you know, think of pioneering thoughts and not just uh, different thoughts or, or copy somebody's thoughts, etc. Think of something different 
which can really cause a change. Okay, so Lyman Spitzer uh, gave that idea that we should try to uh, use the fact that there are other wavelengths of light and we should have a look at them from space by sending a space telescope there. And of course, it didn't get, <laughs> the idea didn't get uh, much support at that time, but slowly over the uh, decades, three, four decades later, Spitzer was actually uh, investigating uh, uh, some uh, concept in which a large telescope would actually be put up in the sky through a, a space rocket system, which NASA had developed at that time. Okay, so yes, from that came the NASA Great Observatories uh, program. Okay, I am not uh, saying that there were no other people working on this. There were already satellites going up there. Okay, small satellites uh, which would look at gamma rays, etc., uh, in in space. But there were no really big observatories up in space. Okay, when I say big, I'll, I'll just come to explaining what is big. Okay. So uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was uh, is very well known to everyone. But then this Great Observatories missions, okay, NASA's Great Observatories included the Hubble Space Telescope, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and the latest, the Spitzer Space Telescope. Okay, so this is the order in which these Great Observatories went up. And just to uh, show you a picture of them, this is. Hubble Space Telescope, uh, uh, and, and here the wavelength range is in a reverse order from my earlier slide. So uh, Spitzer was uh, used to look at the infrared region of the sky, okay? And uh, <coughs> Hubble looked at the, Hubble Space Telescope looked at the visible light uh, in, uh, and some part of ultraviolet. Uh, Chandra the Air Space Telescopes, which is still active, and Hubble is still, still active. Um, Chandra looked at the soft X-rays coming from space. And uh, the CGR, the, uh, the Gamma Ray Observatory, uh, actually looked at the very, very high energy gamma rays coming from the same point of the sky. So now this is a lovely slide in which the same object is shown in different, <laughs> what we can call lights or colors, okay? So for us, colors are only the visible spectrum, but then there are other types of light, as I said. And so here, what you're seeing is the Crab Nebula. So any of you uh, know of uh, astronomical objects? The Crab Nebula is very famous, and it is one of the well-known supernovae, which was seen in uh, around 1,000 years back. And there, there, there's a record of this nebula, uh, this supernova explosion. And because of this explosion, uh, a lot of uh, material was thrown out and uh, it was an energetic event. And of course, each energetic event has these contributors to light. So <laughs> there are different types of light which come out of uh, such energetic events, okay? And uh, these uh, observatories have studied the same object, okay? Same object with uh, different colors, with different light and revealed very different kind of uh, portions which are giving very different light. From this, we can uh, find out which part of the Crab Nebula, the, the leftover remnants of the Crab Supernova, which part of them are doing what kind of phenomena. Okay, So you can see that the, the most of the nebula is quite hot. Of course, you would expect the insides to be hotter and the outsides to be less hot. Very, very evident. Here you can see that this is kind of a net kind of a, uh, a net mesh like feature here when you look at it in visible light. And that's really strange. We are trying to explain how that, uh, you know, bubble like net like feature could have formed. In X rays, we, what we notice is that there's a ring which is formed around the center of it, okay? A ring of swirling gas around the center. And it's sending out two jets into opposite directions. Very contrary to what this and this is showing. This is not showing the jets at all. Here it's clear that there are two jets and there's a ring around the center. Okay. And in uh, this uh, gamma ray observatory, also you can see that the edge of the rings are hot here and here. And the jets are not seen. So it's 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 got energy enough to send out X-rays, but not gamma rays. And in uh, and so and it's not even emitting in these lower wavelengths.
an amazing set of pictures by these uh, observations. So that's I, I'm not going to go into, as I said, all of the details of the whole lot of space telescopes which exist. But I think before we go into details of any of these great observatories also, we should quickly look at what is the aim of a telescope. Uh, have all of you uh, used a telescope ever? Just think of it. Okay. Have, you, have, you, have you looked through a telescope? Have you looked through anything which can make a faraway object look bigger? I wish I could have I could see you at this moment, but uh, and I hope that all of you are nodding in yes. See, uh, many a times uh, you say no, I have not used a telescope. But if you have even used a binocular, it is basically two telescopes for two eyes. So yes, if you have used a binocular, you have used a telescope, not just one, but two of them. So what did what happened uh, with that telescope? Why were you using it? First thing, you were looking at distant objects. You're not looking at you know your own hand or something like that. You're looking at very far away objects with the telescope. Now, when you uh, consider far away objects, your eyes are incapable of doing a few things. One, you cannot see details of it because the distance causes the size of the uh, object to become smaller and smaller. Apparently, of course, <laughs> it's not really reducing. But for us, what is called the angular size, okay, the angle which the dimension of that object makes with my eyes becomes smaller okay so if you can if you hold a coin like i have here okay if i bring it close to my eye i can see so much of of the background being covered by this if i bring it really close i think a lot of this area will be covered so you can measure the angle which the top and the bottom of this coin makes and uh, with your eye now and you can take it far off and then find that same angle. You'll find that this angle is less. So as you go farther and farther, what is called the angular diameter, angular size of it reduces. Okay, and that's why we see things uh, smaller. So telescope basically makes them bigger for you. Another thing is that as, as the object goes farther and farther, the light coming from it, not all of it can reach your eyes. So if you have a bulb or a candle close by to your eye, a lot of it can reach and some part of it will of course go in the other directions. But uh, if you go really far off, that candle, it's still emitting the same amount of light, but only a part of it is coming through to your eye. So it's not remaining brighter. Telescope allows you to see that, collect more of that light. And it can make things look sharper, sharper, not like a knife sharp, but <laughs> they can uh, look more clearer okay so well defined features can be seen so that is of course very necessary because uh, supposing i'm looking at uh, some beautiful bird really far off okay so i can uh, with a telescope and as compared to my eye i can see it bigger and brighter <laughs> but then it's fuzzy would that be of any help i don't think so you will not like that telescope so it definitely has to be bigger brighter it also has to be clearer sharper okay uh, compared to what your eyes can see. So that is what a telescope does. Okay, And if you know basics of telescopes, you've learned it in school, uh, there are two types of telescopes. One is refracting, in which lenses are used, like the ones made by Galileo, which basically uh, collect a lot of light, Okay, uh, from parallel uh, light coming from far off. Uh, the lens collects this and focuses it to a focal point. Okay, So it's basically your eye would be something like my red dot here let's say, compared to the telescope's lens. So your eye would collect very little light. However, this big lens can collect more light. The bigger the lens, the better your telescope. Okay, And of course, it has to also focus it properly. So it focuses it here. And then we use an eyepiece to basically uh, make it parallel again so that your eye can see it. So it's like a funnel. This funnel collects a lot of fluid and then puts it through a small narrow opening at the end. Okay. So your bottle can collect water faster or some fluid faster. Okay, so that's a refracting telescope. Similar principle works with something called a reflecting telescope. Now in this, uh, the light does come through, but it's, it doesn't pass through a lens. It's basically reflected by a, a mirror. Okay, and in this case, it's a concave mirror because what we want is that when the light comes in, okay, it needs to get focused. It needs to 
die uh, it needs to uh, converge to a point okay called a focus so some smart people uh, after newton <laughs> have uh, actually made uh, concave mirrors okay made use of concave mirrors to focus the light uh, onto another mirror and then pass it back through a hole in this mirror towards this side now i i wish i could have given a bigger lecture on the design of this telescope this is called a cassegrain type of telescope in which a concave mirror is used and the light is reflected multiple times and then they, it goes through this opening and uh, you can have an eye piece here to make it make the object visible to the eye so the advantage of uh, sorry the advantage of um, uh, reflecting one to a refracting one is that this mirror can be made much much big okay so i'm sure you you've not seen a huge lens at this big or so in your life but you've always seen a mirror this big every day while you're washing your brushing your teeth so mirrors are easier to make they can be flatter they don't need a clearer medium they don't need to be perfectly transparent and things like that all they need to have is a proper shape and a good coating on top of them okay and so <coughs> people uh, who use modern telescopes mostly use reflecting telescopes okay so what we are doing here uh, what i'm trying to tell you here is that uh, even in telescopes there are different kinds and so in the 80s people decided that we will put a reflecting telescope up there in the sky okay now there are challenges to uh, in in general reflecting light also okay so normal light visible light you can easily reflect with a very shiny coating but how do you aim to reflect something like x rays because x rays would just go through any coating right so there are ways smart ways which people have found out in which uh, something called glancing angle is used so a lot of physics material science again technology optics has gone into it and that's why uh, you need to study well and study engineering and uh, other sciences as well if you are going to be a future astronomy instrumentation person so uh, all this was thought about and then they came uh, with this idea of the first observatory which was to be put up in space was the hubble space telescope now this was suddenly a jump from small telescopes with you know which would be this big in size or something like that and suddenly we had a telescope which was the size of a bus right <laughs> so that was a great observatory the big observatory and uh, the diameter of the mirror okay um, was about i think uh, the, the initial plan was 3 meters but then with a lot of uh, politics which goes on <laughs> uh which which plays a lot of effect on science and technology and their growth uh from 3 meter finally had to settle for 2.4 meters 2.4 meters is taller than me when i stand here it's almost one and a half times my uh, height that is just the size of the mirror of this of this huge telescope so the back side that you see here inside is a mirror which is 2.4 meters in diameter okay and then on top of it there's this whole paraphernalia which keeps the mirror safe and uh, there's this tube which allows the light to enter like this and it reflects from the mirror at the back and then it's reflected multiple times and then there are cameras at the back here which collect this light and give you those amazing photographs that you see uh, you can see them online for free also okay there's of course this flap which can be uh, opened or closed because uh, this has to be orbiting the earth and sometimes uh, at this time it is facing away from the sun and facing away from the earth but in some portions of its orbit it might turn towards the earth or towards the sun and therefore get a lot of light which is not required which is not uh, also uh, asked for okay so therefore it can be closed or opened as needed then there are sol solar panels which provide uh, energy to most of the functioning mechanisms inside and then there are these uh, communication uh, systems which allow all the data which the hubble collects to be sent back to the earth okay it's very basic uh, knowledge of all the hubble space telescope the unique thing to tell you is that <clears throat> it has a 2.4 meter diameter uh, uh, mirror and even to produce one on the earth it's difficult but people managed to produce one for space and sp send it 
on this vehicle system called the uh, space uh, transport system. So you will probably know it better as the space shuttles. That program is discontinued now after you know more than a hundred flights, and it was an amazing uh, time to live in uh, when I was in school and we would have space shuttle flights. It was amazing and it was thrilling. Right, humanity was going up in space. Uh, all the time and then there was a blank and now I think this next step is coming up where <laughs> people should be excited and uh, you know the space vehicles are going up just like that but then there's also a lot of uh, issues with the way they are being done anyway so uh, space race space technology uh, a lot of politics a lot of science a lot of uh, efforts from astronomers has gone into putting up this particular observatory in space and we are really proud of it okay hubble has given us some of the best pictures of the, of the universe some of the best views of the universe and this is called the hubble ultra deep field and uh, in astronomy deep basically implies uh, far okay far and faint <laughs> That's what basically telescopes make you look better. So uh, deep means really far and really faint. And in this picture, uh, one of the you know the longest picture taken by any space telescope, uh, in this case by the Hubble. Uh, this uh, project was commissioned, and they had to ask for time, and you know days were spent on looking at one tiny particular direction in the sky. And in fact, if you look at the amount of area covered by this picture here in the sky, in the real sky, this will be as small as the head of a small pin at, your, at one arm's length. So if you just look at the sky and see how much area is covered by a pin's head at one arm's length, okay, in the sky, this area is that much, right? So just imagine the kind of precision with which Hubble could orbit the Earth yeah, once every 90 minutes and still capture that particular point of the sky so continuously for days and many, many hours were spent continuously taking light from that direction. Okay. And it has been all superimposed and you know added up to give you this picture. And <laughs> this really gives me goosebumps when I tell you that this whole picture, all almost all the light sources that you see, all the very different patches of light that you see in this, and you should see it in, on, on HD on your big screen. All of them are galaxies. Amazing. There must be thousands of galaxies in this picture. Every tiny dot here is a galaxy, okay, full of billions or hundreds of billions of stars. Amazing, right? It's just imagine that kind of a clarity. It is not possible for any telescope from the Earth to give, okay? And this was given by the Hubble telescope to us. So one of the best gifts from the project that we got, okay? And in this whole picture, in fact, there are only, I think there are only one, two, and three stars in this whole field. Stars which are in between us and those galaxies, okay? So these are stars in our own galaxy and they, of course, happen to lie in the field of view. So there are only three or maybe there are four, but that's all. Those are the only stars that you see. The others are all galaxies, okay? Amazing stuff which the Hubble gave us. And I cannot even, this is just the beginning of the whole lot of things which Hubble has given us. So, and a lot of that data is still being analyzed and a lot of science is coming out. Hubble is still active. It was launched in 1990. And I remember I being on a summer vacation. I was very excited <laughs> to read the newspaper that this has been launched. 2020 now. And uh, it's still up there and working well. And hopefully with uh, the new advances and the cheaper uh, ways of uh, sending space missions, maybe there will be a repair mission which might let it continue into the next decade. So hope for that. You guys should also think about uh, contributing to that. Now, there's, uh, there was also, after that uh, came the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. This is a particular uh, telescope. It does not look like a telescope. It doesn't have uh, that kind of a mirror arrangement, etc. And this 
studied these hard, harsh gamma rays coming from space. Okay, and this is just a launch picture. So it was taken up in space, and then uh, with the arm of a of the space uh, of the space shuttle, it was just thrown out <laughs> and put into orbit, and then later it started uh, going around. So it had a relatively short life, but also gave us a lot of gamma ray uh, data. Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. Next, uh, in the lot, did I miss something? No, okay. So uh, next in the lot, uh, I think this was the last actually. So, uh, but uh, uh, this was the infrared telescope, the Spitzer Space Telescope. Finally, Lyman Spitzer over 50 years uh, could see something uh, going up, which was a result of his, um, of his great vision. But it was not the Space Spitzer uh, Telescope. It was the Hubble Space Telescope, which went up before he passed away. Spitzer went up later. And of course, because of the pioneer, it was called uh, Spitzer Space Telescope. And again, it was a, uh, this one was a unique one with uh, aim to study <coughs> objects in infrared. So there are various ways of producing infrared, which is a lower energy light. And uh, of course, uh, this gave us a lot of data and it went on for many years. And just in January this year, it was closed down. Uh, so <laughs> it's had a, a long life and a successful life. And you can see that it has to be protected from other heat sources, other sources of infrared. So it, it, it's, and it's not so easy. I mean, normal light, you can just block it off by a black sheet or some kind of a flap or something, right? But uh, infrared comes like heat. And if you have metal uh, parts of uh, a telescope, just the plain heat from the sun, the infrared from the sun can heat them up, right? So it had a heat shield, it had a blocking shield here, which, and it was never turned towards the sun. <laughs> so you can say it never saw the light of the sun and it had to be always pointed away from it and away from the earth and other sources of infrared. So uh, look it up online, it's got a lot of uh, data as well. And it's provided us information about, uh, you know, really young and really um, low energy objects in the sky. And of course, one other hero of the goods, um, of the great observatories was the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And this one, uh, again, built with a lot of uh, specialized kind of uh, technology used um, <coughs> Uh, gold mirrors, curved gold mirrors in a particular uh, shape to uh, glance x-rays which would come from this direction and it would glance off the walls of these mirrors uh, inside this and go into the camera. So just imagine it's, it's not an x-ray like you get in a medical shop. So it's not something in which there is something in between and then x-rays come from a source that you make and then they are detected here. No, it's not like that. It's actually, you're just taking a picture of the directly of the X-ray source, right? So in between things are not there and you're not even wanting the information about the in between things. You want the source information about the source, which you have not created. So maybe it would be the sun, let's say, right? And you want to know how much X-rays the sun emits from which parts of it, right? <laughs> so, you, so this is not an X-ray, photograph of a shadow of something, which is actual X-ray collection, okay? And that was really difficult, okay? So yeah, uh, people had a success in that and uh, things like uh, charge coupled devices and uh, these uh, special, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, special coatings which uh, came from material science made this possible for uh, this generation to make a X-ray observatory. And it went up and I'll show you some, one more result of um, the future uh, of uh, this thing, that we could get the, now we, we are going to get the James Webb Space Telescope. So after Spitzer went off uh, last, you know, earlier this year, <coughs> we are now readying ourselves for the future, which would be the James Webb Space Telescope. Again, James Webb was a, uh, was a great administrator at NASA and this has been named after him. And uh, this telescope would be really, uh, you know, again, a next step from the previous ones. You can see already the diameter is 
six and a half meters, about three times that of the Hubble Space Telescope, right? Uh, 21 feet, just imagine this, this is humongous. The focal length itself is 100 meters, more than 100 meters, of course. So as you can see in this picture here, uh, as you can see in this picture here, this is, this is the mirror, okay? And uh, this is the secondary mirror. So the light comes from this side, is reflected by these mirrors, which are which, which itself is made out of tinier mirrors. Okay, then it gets reflected onto this, and the optics are perfectly shaped so that after this, it's reflected back through this hole into the cameras behind. Okay, which will have a heat shield again because this particular uh, <coughs> telescope will be looking more at the infrared range, slightly towards the orange from orange to mid infrared. Okay, so this is a precursor, this is the next generation for the Spitzer and the Hubble. Okay, it's going up in space, hopefully uh, next year. This will be humongous, and as I said, that it will have heat shields, heat reflectors, and so many things. And it will actually the, not be covered by a <laughs> big tube here. Okay, that's another challenge. So you have to put this up in space, uh, and of course, you cannot send something which has uh, a diameter of you know 10 meters etc inside a small rocket so you have to fold it up and then you have to put it up in space and then open it up right so that will be an amazing feat to happen and everything has to work properly okay so we're still counting on hubble space telescope until this goes in <clears throat> and hopefully when this is working hubble might also be repaired and we get a lot more uh, information uh, from uh, the previous generation and the next generation telescopes. So this is uh, what is coming, and <clears throat> and uh, basically uh, after this we will we will be able to study uh, a lot of uh, information about the universe, which is hidden there because uh, you know because we have not yet uh, had enough resources to put really large telescopes in the sky. So uh, I'll skip this slide, it's a beautiful image, but uh, as I can say, tell you that the history of the universe is there to be seen. Okay? We can see a lot of things in today's uh, world, which is still huge. And uh, the light from today's world uh, doesn't come from really far off. It comes from very nearby objects like the sun, the other stars, the part of our galaxy, but even they have light coming to us, which is only about, uh, you know, a few lakh years old. <laughs> so that's that you can call it today in comparison to the universe's age. And then if you go slightly beyond, you can, you'll have to look at objects in radio wavelengths, in, in uh, infrared, in, uh, uh, in ultraviolet, etc. Because at that time, the structure formation of the universe was happening. And at that time, the energetics were totally different. And they were not like today's energetics. Further off, we have the really high energy universe, which is kind of uh, about only uh, some lakh years old. Right? At that time, it was really hot. And that universe is explored in what is called the microwaves. Okay, The background radiation from that time has now turned into microwaves because of something called redshift. And uh, there are telescopes up there which are studying that. So Kobe, Planck, etc., are microwave telescopes. I have not gone into details of that in this limited time, but I'm overrunning the time right now. But uh, microwave telescopes are also up there looking at this portion of the universe. If you want to go farther off, these are probably <laughs> things we will not be able to see with telescopes uh, beyond the cosmic microwave. But these are being explored in other high energy uh, research uh, that goes on in the on the Earth with accelerators. So that's like the LFC, etc., or um, the ITER or FAIR. These are new projects which are coming up. So all these things are there, and combined, we will get a better uh, idea of what is there in the uh, universe. Now, uh, quickly coming to what is India's role in all this. So India, yes, India also has its own astronomy satellite. Okay, astronomy space observatory, and it's called AstroSat. Hopefully, you have all heard of it. And <clears throat> AstroSat, very simple name, was launched about five years ago uh, with five telescopes on one satellite. Amazing feat, and this is something which 
uh, is an envy of uh, <laughs> the world's uh, you know space community, but it's a pride of all astronomers because now there's a way in which a, a, a telescope, this observatory, can look in this one particular direction. And let's say, like the picture of Crab Nebula showed earlier, if you want to study the Crab Nebula, you don't have to have four different telescopes in four different parts of the sky and then tell them to look in the same direction. It's the same telescope with, is the same satellite with five different telescopes looking all in the same direction. So you just, all you have to do is click and then they give you a few five different pictures and you combine them and get that picture, get, get the complete picture, right? So uh, so that's, that's what it was. And you can see that there's uh, this telescope, it looks at um, hard X-rays in these boxes called large X-ray proportional counter. And there's a soft X-ray telescope here, this one. There are two ultraviolet telescopes, ultraviolet imaging telescopes. There's also <coughs> the cadmium zinc telluride imagers. So some of these are basically for hard X-rays, some are for soft X-rays, some are proportional counters for really, really energetic, um, uh, uh, what do you say, A radiation coming from space. Okay, and then there's this sky scanning monitor, which um, basically allows you to align the telescope and also uh, study the sky in, uh, uh, visible. So uh, all these uh, telescopes, they can give you really good uh, images of an object in really high energy wavelengths. Okay, that's AstroSat for you. Yeah, I might have a more labeled picture of it. Yes, that's right. So this is a very design element and it uh, studies the sky in optical, ultraviolet, soft and hard X-rays. It's already there five years and there's a lot of, uh, you know, nice discoveries being made, including a discovery recently made by an Ayuga scientist who looked at a galaxy and discovered it in uh, ultraviolet, which even Hubble Space Telescope had not been able to do. So, of course, I will tell you that I will clear up that the Hubble is a 2.4 meter class telescope and these telescopes are about uh, 8 inches or 10 inches uh, big. So, the, the size is pretty different. So, we can't really say <laughs> we put a Hubble, uh, multi wavelength Hubble up there. But yes, it, it is useful and it has a lot of good features on it. <clears throat> Next, uh, in the uh, coming years, we are looking at putting up uh, an ultraviolet uh, satellite to study the sun. It's going to be called Aditya. It's called Aditya L1. And it's going to look at the sun in uh, ultraviolet specially. Okay, with the experience from the AstroSat uh, that I just saw, you know, showed you, the, which has two ultraviolet <laughs> telescopes, not just one, two of them. So with that experience, now we are look, uh, making more such telescopes and now putting them up on the Aditya mission, which will not be close to the Earth. It will go far off into a place called the Lagrangian point around the Earth and the Sun. And from there, it will continuously study the Sun in ultraviolet. This is highly useful and unique also because there are no ultraviolet, uh, very sensitive ultraviolet imagers of the sun right now. And this will be really high uh, resolution and uh, very will give you uh, precise details at very fast uh, rates. <clears throat> so we are looking forward to that and the whole solar astronomy community is looking forward to uh, India's Aditya mission coming up hopefully uh, next year or the year after that. Uh, and uh, just, uh, just to give you an idea, the sun does look very different when you look at it in visible light, like a uh, picture taken of the normally of the sun. If you look at it in ultraviolet, these things like, uh, you know, the sunspots, they might turn really hot. They, they might uh, tell you, this picture in ultraviolet might tell you that things which look dark, which look cold in visible light, might actually be not be emitting invisible, but be emitting a lot in the ultraviolet, which is a higher wavelength, right? And we've actually seen that in action. There's a picture from another space telescope from the previous uh, generation. And uh, just imagine now getting all these pictures in really high resolution with Aditya L1. So that's our future. Uh, India is, of course, also participating in ground-based telescopes, like the 30-meter telescopes. Uh, it's another <clears throat> giant leap for uh, astronomers, but not into space. <laughs> On the Earth itself, we are making leaps and uh, bounds in the size of telescopes. So from uh, the 10 or 11 class meter uh, class telescopes, which exist now, 
we will be going to 30 meters. So it will be a next level jump and it will be a huge eyes. This building would probably be about uh, 15 to 20 stories high. <laughs> Just imagine and you could probably fit a small plane inside it. Okay, so it will be huge. And India is a part of that. <clears throat> Uh, India is also a part of uh, this project called LIGO India. And uh, of course, I mean, it's going to be built in India, in Maharashtra. Uh, this is a LIGO observatory, something made to detect gravitational waves. A completely different beast, completely different uh, kind of uh, way of getting information from the universe. Gravitational waves were discovered in 2015. And uh, now you can get news about it very often, right? So we're going to get the third detector in the world in here in India. It's going to be huge. And <clears throat> see, <laughs> any of you could be part of that project. As, uh, as an astrophysicist, an astronomer, physics person, as uh, an electronics person, an electrician, uh, anything. You, you could be an engineer, civil engineer, you could be a computer engineer, you could be a mechanical engineer, you could be an architect for, for that matter. But uh, there are all these facilities and now they are also being made in India. So I hope you uh, take that cue and participate in this. In fact, uh, space telescopes are also being uh, planned for uh, studying gravitational waves from space itself, okay? And Lisa Pike's Pathfinder was a mission that I wanted to mention quickly while going away, that uh, it has also uh, looked at, uh, you know, <clears throat> as, a, as a Pathfinder mission to creating a huge detector, which would probably span the whole orbit of the Earth, okay, with three detectors, uh, trying to find out really, really low wavelength uh, low low energy uh, gravitational waves in the future. So that's another way of using space and telescopes uh, for studying the universe. So that's it. That's uh, that's all I have to present here. And uh, thank you all for your patience and uh, listening to all this information. I will take some questions and uh, help you out with your queries and doubts. But if you have something else to ask, you can always direct your queries to this email ID. Yes, please. So, uh, yeah, yes, thank, you. thank you for your wonderful uh, session. It was really nice, uh, lovely session. And there are a few questions that are in the chat box. Uh, uh, Himansu asked, uh, can I speak in Hindi uh, to share something? Himansu, are you here? Uh, and one more question asked by Aman. Uh, can you please tell about a Fermi telescope, Fermi telescope. Yes, sure. <clears throat> so, so what, what was it about Hindi? I... Yeah, Himanshu, uh, you don't seem to be there. Uh, you are welcome to, I mean, I, I was told this has to be in English, so I have made this in English, but yeah, you are uh, welcome to mail me later in uh, Hindi if you want. I, uh, if you have any questions now, if you're back, you can ask them in Hindi. And uh, about the Fermi telescope, yes, it was also, uh, I mean, it's another uh, space observatory by NASA and not, not just uh, the Compton telescope, which was a large project. Uh, Fermi also was one of those uh, which uh, went up in 2000s. It was a follower from the Gamma Ray Telescope, which the Compton Gamma Ray Telescope. And uh, <clears throat> these are basically uh, telescopes which look at the really, really highest energy, uh, tele, uh, you know, um, uh, wavelengths of uh, uh, the, the light from the universe. And uh, these are produced by. Uh, let me let's hope. Yeah. So uh, if you can, if you can look at this picture, there's this there's a galaxy called Centaurus A shown in various kinds of. Uh, images. So this is the optical image, this is radio image, this is the X-ray image, and again, just like the um, the Crab Nebula, uh, it's it's different parts of it look different in different light. Okay, so this is the whole galaxy as you would see it in optical. Okay, and if you just switch your eyes, <laughs> if you could flick your eyes and turn the radio on, you'd see that the whole thing with the light from the stars and it's everything has disappeared, completely gone, and it's just these two jets coming from a bright point 
that is left in radio. So there's something which is emitting in low energies in this particular way. And then if you look at it in X-rays, yes, it, it's very similar to the uh, radio. So there's a bright point and the jet coming out. The other jet is not seen very well. But then there is also this halo around it, right? Which again seems to be emitting a lot of uh, high energy particles. Now this is Chandra and then there's uh, DSS. This is Earth-based and uh, Earth-based radio telescopes. But uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that there is another uh, range here called gamma rays. And there's, there are in-between ranges like ultraviolet and infrared, which uh, have uh, not been explored in this picture. Okay, so uh, sorry. Yeah, so this, this range here uh, is covered by the Fermi telescope and <coughs> uh, basically uh, it's, it, it scanned the whole sky and uh, created lovely, uh, you know, panoramic pictures of the sky with all of the gamma ray uh, bursts and gamma ray, special gamma ray um, events which have happened in the sky. They've been recorded by this telescope. So. Uh, of course, I, I cannot cover all the telescopes. There are, there are so many other exciting telescopes, like the Herschel telescope, for example, is another favorite of mine. So, um, so I can't go into all of them, but uh, let's see <laughs> what other questions are there. Okay. So what is the cosmic uh, wave background? Okay. And... <clears throat> All right. So the cosmic microwave background is detected in these microwave uh, ranges or millimeter ranges. In fact, uh, this is uh, the really high energy light from the earliest universe. When, if uh, we go by the Big Bang theory, uh, the 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 evidence is there to uh, tell us that at certain point of time, really early in the history of the universe, really early means uh, almost at the beginning, I mean, compared to the 13, 14 billion years the universe has existed, if we really be looking at the first, say, one lakh years, okay, uh, the universe was really hot and everything was very dense and close together, okay, so therefore uh, the energy was very tightly packed and therefore the energy was high and this soup of particles, etc., etc., they had energy, they had, uh, but this energy could not, you know, they were not far enough that the energy needed to transfer. So there's no need to transfer energy from here to here. They're just all touching each other, right? But as the expansion happened, there was a time, certain time, when uh, adequate distances came in between, let's say, protons and electrons and other fundamental particles. And then if, you know, this proton was, highly energetic uh, and it wanted to give out this energy there was some space in which yes this energy had to travel before it gets to the next particle okay and this uh, this era is called the decoupling era okay where, where they suddenly slowly grew space between things right and then this energy had to be traveling from one place to another and what is the best way of making this energy travel efficiently light and uh, since the energy was high, really high at that time, this light would have been gamma rays. And everywhere there would have been a flood of gamma rays going around here and there, here and there. Here and there. Now, where did this light go? Right. So the thing is that as the universe expanded, the wavelengths of this light, light expanded. Okay. So this light, which was produced at that time, which was only, uh, it was everywhere. The same kind of light was everywhere. Now, as the universe expanded, the wavelength of this light has also expanded, and this is called the redshift. Okay, so as the wavelengths expand, as the as wavelength become bigger, you, you can see that things which are on the bluer side of the visible, they uh, if you stretch their wavelengths, they become red. Okay, so wavelengths increase in this direction. So if there's something blue, if you stretch its wavelength, it becomes red. Right. So the universe expansion has basically expanded them and they're not not this wavelength now they have stretched onto this region over so many billions of years and this light this remnant light is what is the background radiation which is everywhere even here now right now it's there but it's in the form of microwaves and if i have not uh, absorbed them <laughs> up then it's free for uh, looking at it okay so if you put up a telescope in this direction uh, in, in this in the space and look at various directions, okay, you can see how much amount of um, 
this microwave background is coming and this actually was done and we saw that it's fairly consistent in all directions except for particular sources of microwaves. So this background is uh, the remnant of the early universe. So <clears throat> that's the uh, thing and then the how is infrared produced? So again I can Sorry. Yeah. So infrared again, as I said, kind of light has a. One of you please uh, mute the light uh, sound so I can speak without echo. Manoj uh, Kumar, kindly mute. Uh, okay, so I'll ask yeah. question later. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm taking the questions which are in the chat box right now. Hoping that they are the ones to be treated earlier. Uh, the organizers can intervene. So infrared, uh, not just infrared, all the other kinds of light can be produced in nature. Okay. And uh, uh, you want to study that, I suppose you should go and take a course in electrodynamics and you'll uh, get to understand the you know, ways of producing all these frequencies. Of course, that is one of the challenges when you come to astrophysics. You have to come with an understanding of how different kinds of lights are produced, the phenomena which can produce it, the energetics of it. So I'm not going into details of uh, infrared, but yeah, I mean, if, uh, uh, infrared can be produced by electrons um, going around fast in, a, uh, in an atom even. So given that adequate amount of energy is there. Just an example. Okay. Um, can light destroy pollution by using some lens? Uh, this is not really clear. So if you care to clear it up, I can answer this later. Okay. I have seen a question about astrobiology, but I'm going to come back to that later because it's not really relevant right away. But I will address that at the end. Um, okay. <clears throat> Uh, is there how uh, is there a paradox that after Big Bang particles and antiparticles were created in unequal amount in initial stages, as our universe is formed, which must be against laws of physics? Um, well, I cannot go into that because this is not really related to uh, space telescope right now. Uh, are there any other relevant questions, uh, admin? Uh, do you do you see anything on YouTube or any other place? Uh, not yet, sir. So uh, okay. there is no relevant questions related to uh, telescopes. Maybe uh, if you have uh, time, you can address that aspect. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'm just ensuring that uh, things are fair and people who are asking relevant things uh, can do that. So uh, others can please keep uh, typing in the chat. I don't know how much time I have. Okay, so uh, yeah, so about astrobiology um, and astrochemistry and astrophysics and astrogeology, if you want. Uh, yes, so if you want to study uh, astronomy and astrophysics in India, uh, there are several very good uh, institutes uh, because this is the most popular kind of uh, field and has the most resources. Particularly, if you want to study astrobiology, I will. I will give you examples of people who, let's say, work at NASA or other institutes and are astrobiologists. They are actually uh, doing some kind of physics. Okay, so it's or there are biologists who are specialists in some biology, and then they are putting their uh, skills to use in an astro or a space-related field. Okay, so in general, I am very wary of studying only astrobiology because there's no, I mean you have to first learn all of astrophysics and then learn biology as well. So I, I would suggest if you're really young and starting uh, you know like high school or something like that I would suggest that you pick one of these so you either study uh, physics or study biology and then uh, go forth with your research interest in such a way that the, the what you learn is useful in astrophysics or astro uh, or, or uses astronomical data or is useful for space technology so that would be a more uh, you know efficient way to use your time that you uh, spend studying otherwise as i said for you know there's nothing nothing special called astrobiology uh, 
in general some people may disagree but uh, and some people are even starting you know paid courses and things like that so i would suggest that if you really want a good uh, career in astrobiology why not focus why either on biology or astrophysics and when you go into astrophysics let's say you start studying the biomolecules in the uh, in some uh, nebula around some uh, old star or something like that right so that is astrobiology so you are actually studying the biological compounds in near that star so you are an astrobiologist at that time of course if you want to study particularly about whether microbial life can exist on in uh, the oceans under titan <laughs> ice uh, layers etc then become a biologist or become a geologist that would be more useful right and then you go to an astronomy institute saying okay i know i understand microbes i understand uh, exobiology etc do you want to uh, want me to help studying titan right then you are an astrobiologist so uh, that is my suggestion uh, there are no in general courses or institutions directly for astrobiology uh, again it doesn't make too much sense as i said but uh, you can uh, probably study uh, biology uh, there might be uh, but the research uh, positions are there and uh, more would be coming in the in the next decade or so because there are many <clears throat> avenues coming up many new telescopes coming up which will focus like the 30 meter telescope which will focus on these biomolecules and <clears throat> places where exobiology is, will be really useful it will give you give you really high resolution pictures of the let's say the satellites of jupiter etc which will be used by astrobiologists okay so uh, coming back to chirag's question uh, he has asked that uh, can you can you destroy pollutants by burning them up <laughs> like used to burn piece of paper using convex lens okay i understand now uh, no because you can't say this is a pollutant and that is that is not this molecule is a pollutant and that is not a pollutant <laughs> so you can't do that and uh, in the air everything is there so if you if you take like a glass of uh, sugar water can you <laughs> burn the sugar and leave the water out i don't think so so uh, the air is like that the atmosphere is like that you can't really do that uh, particularly yes of course if you have a whole lot of plastic you could burn it but then it would just create more pollution okay yeah i think uh, uh, Nagulan is having uh, one question. And, yes, please. Uh, Nagulan, go ahead. Nagulan, you can go ahead. Uh, followed by Manoj Kumar, you can uh, also ask the question. Yeah. yeah. Sir, how to make infrared picture, sir? For that, you'll need an infrared uh, camera. <clears throat> uh, and these are not so easily available. I cannot uh, say where you will get an infrared camera. But... some of your mobile phones actually the cameras are also sensitive so you can see that in this picture if uh, i don't know if uh, you can see that after the visible portion the infrared starts immediately there's no like a big gap or something like that so so even if you go slightly here if your camera right there's a sensitivity of the camera so you can tell the camera that i will be sensitive from 400 to 700 Now there is no <laughs> way in this whole world to say that exactly 400. You have to cut it off, right? So it might go to 350, right? Which is infrared. So sometimes uh, you can try try things like you know if you shine your um, remote control in uh, TV remote control, let's say the bulb at the end of it when you press it, you can't see any light coming from it, but your TV sees it. So your TV actually has an infrared sensor. so when you point it right to that sensor this light shines and that sensor responds to it so if you can point that micro uh, that uh, remote to your phone and you your phone might actually show you know so you can go into the phone mode uh, sorry yeah <laughs> your camera mode and when you have a live picture try shining that light and you will see that light glowing okay so that's how that's the farthest i can tell you about uh, you know seeing infrared with the with a easily available sensor but uh, otherwise i am not aware of uh, easily available cameras which can show you infrared <coughs> yeah uh, 
Sir, who invented Hubble Space Telescope and when? Okay, Hubble Space Telescope was not invented. It is, uh, telescopes were invented 400 years ago. Then reflecting telescopes were invented around uh, uh, 350 years ago. Then there has been a change in the way the telescopes are being used. Okay, and uh, in the last century, there were there have been huge lot of telescopes made on the Earth. One of them was the huge uh, Hubble Space Telescope, which was instead of putting here it on the Earth, we put it up in space. So it was not a reinvention of something. The things in it, many things in it, are something like uh, telescopes here on the Earth. But of course, some things had to be adapted so that they can exist in space. So. <clears throat> It's not one person's invention. This is a, you know, <laughs> the final cost of it when it went up was about $1 billion. So nobody has $1 billion to go and invent a quick a telescope. So <laughs> jokes apart, uh, there was a team which worked on it. It's a huge team uh, at uh, NASA. And uh, so, so if you say, okay, NASA invented, is, it's not NASA is not one person. It's a huge team which uh, basically worked on this project called the Great Observatories Project. Hubble was the first one to go because that made the most sense because it could get the best pictures and also make sense to the uh, general public and have a lot of science uh, information in it. So uh, let's say uh, NASA made it <laughs> like that. The team, the great team at NASA made it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you, Nagala. Uh, Manoj Kumar is not here. Uh, I think uh, there is no more question uh, in YouTube as well as uh, in the platform. Okay, so Ashish has asked this question, which is unrelated, but I'll, uh, I don't know, I'm not an expert in this. Uh, he's trying to uh, ask whether there's a, there's a paradox uh, in there being an inequality. Uh, so basically, now we can see that we are all made out of particles and not antiparticles. And I don't see an anti Samir on an anti Earth around going around an anti Sun uh, somewhere in the universe right now. So, uh, well, <clears throat> that is, a, uh, is not a paradox, but that is a question we are trying to find out. Uh, well, you know, uh, paradox is something hypothetical which suddenly crops up. But this is a real thing. This is there, and we have to answer that question. And uh, as you say, it's, it must be against laws of physics, but why go into hypothesis against laws of physics rather than first trying to eliminate the simpler options which do follow the laws of physics, okay? And uh, there's no uh, evidence that uh, a galaxy cannot be made out of antiparticles completely. So <laughs> we, we are just, we just have to have enough observations. So we are looking for observations as in that quest, uh, our space telescopes will be a big help for us. Uh, also, our ground-based telescopes. So, therefore, you know, in, this is this is uh, one of the you know golden ages for astronomy and space technology, and you're living right within it. So, I hope you take this chance, you, know, you take this opportunity, and uh, do something useful uh, related to this field. And you know, uh, I, I also hope you're you're you do some pioneering work. So there are questions which are uh, which are seeking answers, like this, you know, understanding the universe and the things which are already seen. But then there are also questions which have not even been thought of, right? So you, you can pick a line. Of course, there are some things which come spontaneously, but some things which come with a lot of hard work. You can pick a line and work on any of these, and this will be useful for uh, future knowledge and generations okay so yeah thank you sir thank you very much yeah uh, there are no more questions i think um, okay namit kumar is saying something <laughs> yeah so samit sir thank you thank you very much sir. really uh, it is a knowledgeable uh, presentation and lovely presentation you have inspired the most students i guess <laughs> So some students will uh, send a mail and ask you some ask some questions, I guess, uh, to the side of uh, yeah. Sure. Really, thank you, thank you very much, uh, 
Samir sir. And uh, looking forward to have uh, some other meetings with the STAC uh, soon. Uh, so I will communicate with you. Sorry, uh, sorry for that uh, miscommunications. No, no, those are things not to be discussed here. Don't worry. <laughs> thank you. All the best to all the all your students and uh, thanks for coming in here in the evening. Hope everything uh, settles there and you all just passes off without much uh, damage or anything. So, thank you all and have a great evening. Yeah, thank okay, you. Sir. I, I clearly understand.